Before we dive in, just wanted to give a quick shout out to Matrix Sport, the sponsor of this week's episode and one of the fastest growing, largest digital asset platforms based out of Asia. More on them soon to come. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. I'm your co-host, Mike Ippolito, and I'm joined, as always, by my notorious co-host, Mr. Tyler Neville. What's going on, Tyler? Mike, pleasure to see you. That uh, that adjective was in honor of, uh, I'm not sure if you could call it honor, but Conor McGregor and his uh, <laughs> his his uh, spectacle the other week. Um, oh, yeah. So I hope you enjoyed the adjective. Yeah. I'm no, not I think Notorious is looking for a new home. Uh, so maybe it'll, maybe it'll migrate its way to you. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome guys. Well, look, uh, I want, I'm excited because we're going to be trying out a bit of a new format here with the weekly roundups. Uh, in the past, we've given you kind of three or four big news stories that Tyler and I, and sometimes Casey break down together. We're going to be splitting it into three different segments, uh, this week. So we'd love to get everybody's thoughts on how you enjoy, uh, the new structure of the show. We're basically going to be kicking things off with a bit of a markets wrap and just uh, an analysis of different interesting charts that Tyler and I kind of scraped together over the course of the week. Uh, next, we're going to be getting into the three or four big stories that we tend to cover, and that's going to be uh, kind of business as usual. And then we're going to wrap things up with uh, interesting tweets and takes uh, that we've kind of scraped off the interwebs. Um, so new format. Bear with us. It's a little bit new. I'm going to be trying some technical stuff. Everybody knows that's not my forte. So you're just going to have to bear with your boy as we figure this out, okay? Mike, for, for a Gen Zer, you have the skills, the tech Whoa, skills. whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> what did you just? I'm sorry. What Wait, are you, you just like, You're on the cusp of a Zoom. I am a millennial. <laughs> End of recording. We're done. Tyler, it's been great. Jesus Christ. That is not how I wanted to start my Friday. Then that's what I'll call you a millennial. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Uh, let's just get into it. There's enough small talk here. In fact, no more small talk ever. Um, all right. We're going to start with the 10 year here, um, which is creeping uh, back up, uh, although it's still pretty historically depressed levels. The reason why we start here is obviously it's such an important financial instrument, but in general, there's been a lot of, uh, let's say, curiosity as to why the 10-year is where it is, especially when there's so much uh, worries about inflation. So obviously, CPI over the last couple of months has been a uh, record. Core PCI in June, uh, I think, was the largest month-over-month uh, -month increase in over 30 years. So Tyler, what's your take on why the 10 years is at where it's at? So my view has changed on this. I thought we were in a you know, pretty much secularly inflationary environment. And mm -hmm. looking at global markets um, and talking to a lot of people like Mike Howell, China is definitely trying to stomp out the commodity inflation is, is my read. And that's actually flowing through to U.S. Treasury markets. And if you look at the correlation between like ch the Chinese economy slowing and the U.S. Treasury, we could be in this whole new world where he calls it U.S. monetary policy is now made in China, where we actually kind of like get the benefit of China, China slowing in terms of our 10-year yields. So I think that's been the main contributor of this pullback in yields um, pretty much for the past like two months. Yeah. If you listen to the way that financial media reports it, then you'd basically say that uh, the market is believing Jay Powell when he says that inflation is going to be transitory. So obviously, yeah. we saw this kind of pickup in yields during kind of the reflationary trade, and it's been kind of a straight march down uh, for the past month and a half or so. Um, the other, like I, in, uh, in an interview that went live on On the Margin this week, we talked to Jeff Snyder, um, and his he kind of flips uh, conventionary thinking about just liquidity uh, in general and says that actually what we're looking at is a global dollar shortage, which we've essentially been suffering through since 2008, uh, a very big uh, standing, very popular narrative on its head. Uh, and basically, as the reason for lowering yields is the need for high quality collateral in the form of U.S. Treasury. So obviously, as the need for collateral goes up, and uh, those yields end up shrinking. So two explanations there. Uh, un unclear, but yeah, for whatever it is, it looks like yields are not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. um, let's talk about this next uh, chart, Tyler. You sent it over to me. I'm not going to try to announce this, so tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, this is just the triple C bond option adjusted spread. Triple C bonds are the junkiest of the junk debt. It's the mm -hmm. kind of like real crap zombie companies that you know are just trying to pay their interest on their debt and mm -hmm. people are buying that debt and this option adjusted spread as that line falls 
that basically means that credit is becoming easier and easier to refinance for, for really, really crappy companies, essentially. So when that line spikes higher, the credit markets kind of shut off. Like you can see early in 2020, that line spikes higher. And that's when like no one was providing any financing for the, the junk debt and pretty much any debt out there at that point. And we've come from 18% all the way down to six, which is pretty much at the record lows. So all these pension funds are sopping up high yield debt at like record rates to basically try and get funded for all the boomer uh, liabilities. And it's shrinking the supply of available debt, which mm. creates this salubrious uh, liquidity in the US markets. Yeah. So piecing together a couple of things there, talking about the pensions just as driver of, of uh, flows in, in fixed income. In that interview with Brian Reynolds, and I actually got uh, drinks with our mutual friend, uh, Teddy Valley, uh, last night, um, and he mentioned that actually uh, pensions, COVID has actually been pretty good for pensions, and a lot of those unfunded liabilities are actually now more and more funded, and they're basically looking to play not to lose, which is usually what they're doing anyway, uh, but kind of locking in uh, and moving actually further and further into fixed income and bonds. So does that tally with kind of what we're seeing here and more and more funds moving into kind of uh, high yield? Yeah, I mean, all they're trying to do is match liabilities um, with the duration of their liabilities. And mm -hmm. if you have like, if your pension is very funded, like a lot of the Canadian pensions are very funded and US pensions are catching up now. The, the stock market's at all time highs, you know, debts at all time highs too. So now they just want to kind of like keep the game going. But if you keep collapsing those spreads, it creates this like, massive buyback effect. It's a debt for equity swap where you can basically issue debt, shrink the floats of your company, and then earnings grow. You get earnings growth. So that is, I mean, if this stays down here, we could be in for like a several year bull market. That's crazy. I mean, certainly the, the takeaway that can't really escape you with this chart is that there's no hint of credit stress in the market right now. And that's typically mm -hmm. good for equities. And I think the SPIs that were back at all time highs are right around there. So yeah, yeah, pretty and I mean the the bottom line is the Fed and the the Treasury are providing you know this backdrop of of insanely uh, great liquidity. So you know you could say they're it's as great for pensions now because they just pulled out like also what twelve trillion dollars worth of fiscal and monetary policy, but back mm -hmm. in the beginning you know. Credit, you know, pensions were basically, you're going to have people out there, pitchforks on your front lawn. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, all right, let's move into uh, both of our favorite space, uh, crypto. Uh, so let's look at Bitcoin, I guess, over the course of the last week or so. Uh, we're still trading pretty much range bound, right? We're between that um, 30 to 40K mark. Uh, there was a worrying couple of days when we were dipping below um 30k where we're sitting around 29,000 uh, for a couple of days uh, but we're right back up to that range that we've been in basically since the end of June. Um what's your take on what's happening here? Um I think this bounce was kind of a short squeeze. There was a big institutional put buyer down when we kind of like were lingering at 30,000 and I think it was like the 22,000 20,000 strike in BTC. And mm -hmm. when Kathy Wood, Elon, Jack Dorsey were talking at the, the B Word conference, I think that caused a little bit of a short squeeze here. And now mm -hmm. it's just consolidating. But pretty low liquid, you know, tape. I don't think there's much to glean from here. It's, you know, we've defended thirty thousand a couple of times. All the technicians are saying, Hey, this is this is fantastic, you know. If you're bullish, yeah. like it's a great sign. So yeah. uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll keep watching. I think the same thing is basically happening uh, in ETH as well. Um, and I guess this is just sort of the story of, I mean, we're kind of in the summer doldrums here. Even when I was kind of looking for news stories this week, it's, there's not a whole lot going on, right? We're, uh, you know, in the, la in the third week of July, uh, typically this is a pretty slow time for markets and just news in general. Uh, we're a couple of weeks away from basically all of uh, the financial sector in New York uh, departing the city for the Hamptons, or more likely the Bretton Woods Conference, which you should all go to. Um, and cool. so I think things are just 
pretty slow. Um, it seems like, you know, there's kind of resistance forming here um, at that 2000 level. Who knows, though? Uh, I think in general, the market will... Huh? Support for Yeah, me. support, support. I think uh, in general that the market will be pretty happy if um, ETH holds this 2000 uh, mark and Bitcoin stays above 30,000. Um, mm -hmm. But who knows? Um, uh, this ratio is pretty interesting to watch. I uh, will admit we borrowed this uh, from our friends over at Bankless, but I think it's a pretty interesting ratio to check out. So this is the ratio of ETH to uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and basically, I think the, the best way to look at this um, indicator is basically a relative scale of demand for ETH versus Bitcoin. Um, and while you might look at not understanding these two markets as being um, quite similar, just like the number one and number two crypto, they're quite different use cases. So I think just in general, um, as this uh, indicator tends to rise or this ratio tends to rise, uh, then that indicates more bullish sentiment because alts, Ethereum being the largest quote unquote alt, uh, tend to lead uh, in a bull market. So, you know, it's kind of holding that level above uh, 0 0.055, um, which is good, um, but just something to kind of keep an eye on and pay attention to mm -hmm. basically also, also yeah. bullish DeFi as you see that rising line yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um and next uh i want to switch over here and show you a couple of these uh charts uh, especially prepared by uh tyler here so thank you very much tyler um still <laughs> it's stolen yeah um all right tyler tell me what we're uh, tell me what we're looking at here yeah, so this is the Mike Howell chart from his latest July pitch book. It's basically showing the economic surprise index from China versus the correlation in 10-year treasury yields. So we kind of saw China lead us down because if economic surprises are coming in below expectations, that's kind of a sign growth is slowing in China, which mm. seems to front run the U.S. 10-year yield. So that's kind of changed my perception on uh, on this thing. Um, something, to, something to watch. And with China, the China news, we can get into that later. I think it's really that's probably the biggest news of the summer, to be honest. And I agree. Happening in a low liquidity tape, which is even worse. So it's my my read is this is happening to them at the worst possible time. Uh, I don't think we'll get into that later. But keep going. Yeah. All right. Talk to me about this was a really interesting chart for me. I've got a bit of a quote uh, to go along with this, but I'm curious. Uh, just just tell me what we're looking at here. Yeah. So this is the U.S. real yields on the 10 year yield. So if you take the CPI rate um, and subtract uh, if you take nominal rates where they're trading on the 10 year and uh, subtract the inflation, the same duration inflation, uh, you get negative real rates. So that basically shows you that you can finance, you can borrow money below the rate of inflation, which theoretically is, has been bullish for, for gold, finite assets, um, stuff you can't produce more of. Um, and and it's, it's interesting here. You, you saw the market react really strong to this in 2020. Gold shot up to 2000 and ever since then, it's been making lower highs, which kind of show is it's an odd thing because real rates are at their new their their lows again, right? Um, techs reacting, you know, maybe people are just saying, you know what, I'd rather own tech that's growing at twenty five percent in the S and P, which is growing more than gold. So people are using stocks more as a proxy um, for real yields falling. Yeah, absolutely. What's your I do want to, yeah, I want to share this quote. This came from uh, Macro Voices this past week. A um, lot of stuff to unpack here, but the quote is, the structural arguments are all in place for gold with the fusion of fiscal and monetary policy and debasement of currency. That's all a good environment for gold. However, I think it's worth going back to the 1970s and remembering that gold crashed 40% during some of the high inflation episodes. This was when real, real rates turned extremely negative, And the argument at the time was that real rates actually couldn't get any more negative. Uh, so a reminder here again, I mean, lots of takeaways there. I think one thing that's kind of interesting is it's a reminder uh, that markets are forward looking as well. So one way to interpret this chart um, is that market participants actually don't see real rates going any more negative, right? So they're not looking at what real rates are doing right now, but they're looking 
uh, at the future. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe one way to interpret this is whatever the reason, right, for the 10 year doing what it's doing, they either think that yields are going to go back up or inflation is going to prove to be more transitory than the, than the recent CPI prints we're seeing. I yeah. don't know. What's your take? Yeah, I think it's that. And the the higher inflation goes, the, the quicker j Powell will have to taper. So that's sort of the backdrop now is like you get really big inflation prints. People are like, all right, now the Fed's in a position where they have to do something and tighten. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. And then the last chart that we're going to show this week before we kind of get into our stories um, is just crypt uh, crypto VC inflows. Uh, so this shows um, in billions of dollars there on the left, the amount of uh, dollars getting deployed into crypto. For those of you who aren't watching on video, um, VC fund inflows peaked in Q1 of 2018 and Q1 of uh, 2020. Um, and the point I think to make here, uh, at least the point that I'll make, and Tyler, I know you've got a slightly different spin on this uh, than I do, is that VCs, just like everyone else, um, tend to chase. Uh, and sometimes like when the most money is coming in from VC, that actually tends to mark market tops. Uh, and again, I'm going to list a, a quote here that I heard from, uh, I don't actually know this guy's real name. His name is Light, Crypto Light. This was on Up Only. I thought this was really good. Um, but basically, I think the markets don't really care about news, and you're seeing that right now. Uh, the market right now just doesn't care. It's having an unwinding cycle that can usually only resolve itself in the form of vol collapsing and an accumulation base where high conviction holders come in, buy, and hold for the long run and refuse to be shaken out. In terms of VCs, I've heard a lot of people say, look at how much money is coming in from A16Z, from all these funds that have raised, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in general, I don't think that VCs claim to be good market timers. Andrew Kang made a point when he said that people coming in from traditional VC misunderstood crypto and came late to the party. And for the same reason they misunderstood it when it was time to buy, they're now buying when it's time to wait. Uh, and personally, that explanation resonated with me based on my experience in crypto. But Tyler, I'm, I'm curious what you think of, of this chart here. I think it's very foretelling in, in a lot of ways. I look at it a little bit differently because the macro backdrop is a little tiny bit different, right? So in 2018, I think they were tightening monetary policy, shrinking their balance sheet. Um, and that probably led to the crypto collapse a little bit. Whereas now, like, I think they're in this MMT world where they can't really tighten and the deficit is so large that they'll have to keep doing QE in some capacity. Even if there is liquidity, you know, drops, you know, quickly, I think they're going to have to come back in. Like Greg Foss says, is it's a mathematical, you know, <laughs> math. it's, it's one of 11 maths. It's grade 11 yeah. maths. Grade 11. <laughs> and, and it's, it's kind of true. So my read on this is like, if they just keep monetary policy the same, perhaps this time is different. I know those are the famous last words, but like, it's it's possible that this could keep going this time. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, the point I guess I was trying to make as well, and we've talked about this before on the show. I think we talked about this in the episode where we talked about uh, Andreessen Horowitz's new two point two billion dollar fund. I think this is my my personal take on this is that this is short term bearish, long term bullish because crypto tends to move in these cycles that follow price, and when price runs up. Uh, that tends to attract the next wave of capital and entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs that are going to build the next wave of successful projects and the next wave of capital that's actually going to fund uh, those projects. So if you think about a lot of like the big, really dominant companies right now, like if you're looking at this time period of all these VC dollars that poured in in Q1, Q2, Q3 of 2018, they funded some of the most successful infrastructure-led companies that you're seeing today. So like Fireblocks, BlockFi, a lot of those companies were getting funded right around this time, and now they're all giants. Um, yeah. I think what will be interesting is to see where uh, these VC dollars start pouring into the space um, in 2020, or sorry, in 2021, rather. Um, my personal thought is, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, a couple of years ago, they restructured their entire fund. They're no longer a VC, they're an RIA. So they can actually buy token projects directly. And a lot of the interesting, innovative stuff in this space is no longer that those infrastructure sorts of plays, uh, those CFI infrastructure plays, but more on the DeFi side of things. You know what just struck me as you were saying that is mm. back in 2018, that chart 
you didn't have those companies like BlockFi or Fireblocks or whatever. Now those companies like, you know, BlockFi, I think they're just doing their Series E and expected to go public soon at, at like a $4 billion, $5 billion valuation. That's – so if you're Coinbase and you just went public in your $65 billion valuation, are you going to go invest in – something in traditional finance? Are you going to invest in consumer retail? No, you're going to invest in what you know well. So now you have these mega behemoth companies that can tap public markets. Maybe this cycle is a little bit, it has a little bit more legs, right? You have real tangible dollars being made now. Oh my God, Todd, unquestionably, man. Like the, it's hard to describe the feeling uh, that people had in, like the latter half of 2018, 2019, this space was dead. It was dead. I mean, especially, I mean, right now, like we talk a lot about DeFi. I feel like I'm being transparent in my like interest in that. There was no tokens, anything. It was, everyone was burned from ICOs, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, Bitcoin is the only thing. If we didn't have Bitcoin, the space would be nothing. A lot of these people that you see tweeting like, oh, I've been hodling and stacking sats this whole time. They were quietly looking at other options and off ramps and stuff. Like it was, there was a, a genuine question what, what this space was going to be. Was there anything really here? Uh, mm -hmm. I actually think you, that's a lot of the sentiment there's kind of, that drives these Bitcoin maxis. Uh, because, and, and I understand it. Um, and I only came in, that was my kind of first cycle and drawdown. They had gone through some of them too before that, where they saw a lot of failed projects kind of get washed out. Um, yeah. Human beings are stimulus response learning. You know, yeah. you you experience a stimulus, your body produces a response. It's really hard to use logic to override uh, that kind of emotional response. And you stuff, so. learning or lemming? Learning. <laughs> Dad, Dad, oh my god! You must kill at restaurants, Tyler. You must yeah. kill. I bet the waitresses <laughs> think you're hilarious. Oh my god! <laughs> that was the worst. He just roasted me so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren's yeah. definitely listening to this back. Like, mm, yes, yes, yes. All right. Um, <laughs> oh, um, all right. Let's uh, let's move on to our next uh, our next section here, which is like our traditional uh, kind of just covering stories. Um, I'm actually going to skip the first one. I was going to talk about the ECB. They're holding monetary policy steady. Uh, I'd actually really like to get into uh, what's going on with JP Morgan. So. JP Morgan this week became the first bulge bracket to give retail wealth clients access to crypto funds. I think this is a great example of the first part of that quote from Light Crypto, which is that the market just doesn't care about news right now. And honestly, object like we run a news site. Objectively, the amount of good announcements and bullish announcements that are coming out right now are not wildly dissimilar from when price was running up and Bitcoin was going to be a $10 trillion asset and yada yada. There's a lot of really bullish stuff happening right now. Uh, it just isn't impacting price, right? So people don't care about it as much. Uh, and it feels like screaming into the void a little bit. Um, I will say this one really resonates with me uh, because I've always seen RIAs as the natural buyers of this space. And they're going to be a big, really important group that's going to push institutions to adopt more quickly. And if you look at two of the big financial services companies that got involved early, Fidelity and TD Ameritrade, what do they have in common? Huge networks of RIAs, and they have a much bigger consumer or retail facing business, basically, than some of these like, uh, you know, like a JP Morgan or uh, Morgan Stanley or Goldman. Um, yeah. But I'll read, I'll read the, the details of the announcement and Tyler, and tell me what you think. Um, so basically, uh, JP Morgan has been making a significant push to grow its $630 billion wealth management business. And it told advisors in a memo earlier this week that they can now take orders to buy and sell five cryptocurrency products, notably. So funds or trust, uh, four from Grayscale uh, and one from Osprey, uh, effective on July 19th. Um, so this includes the bank's uh, self-directed clients using its commission-free Chase trading app, mass affluent clients whose assets are managed by financial advisors under JP Morgan Advisors, and ultra-rich clients serviced by the private bank. Uh, JP Morgan's advisors can execute only unsolicited crypto trades, meaning that advisors cannot recommend the products, but they are allowed to buy or sell on behalf of a client's requests. Uh, the funds that JP Morgan has approved include the Bitcoin Trust, Bitcoin Cash Trust, Ethereum Trust, and Ethereum Classic Vehicles. What do you think? Just, just an amazing pivot. 
Right. If, I wish you could juxtapose Jamie Dimon's quotes about this stuff to where they are today. Like somebody did that on Twitter. I couldn't find <laughs> it, but someone literally uh, did his quotes throughout the years on Bitcoin and how it's evolved. Um, it's just incredible. My my read is banking as we know it is so done. Like the transaction fees, everything. I mean, I'm refinancing a mortgage. It takes like oh, I know for, it's coming here. If forever. I mean, really, and and so they're forced to get into this this thing that will probably disrupt them, and this is the first step. And there's no, I don't think there's any denying it now. You you had your chance to deny it for years and basically just say this is not a thing, and they flip flopped within like a year. I mean, it, it's incredible, Jamie Dimon. So. Yeah. I'm shocked that we got through that without your favorite phrase. Cavity search. Here's another take, though. Um, sorry for anyone working at these banks listening to this, but banks are doing a pretty horrendous job at giving their clients exposure to this. And I mean that in two different ways, right? It's kind of happening actually at the regulatory level, but it's mm -hmm. also happening at like the decision-making level. So... Look at so first of all, there's no ETF. That's not their fault, right? That's kind of regulators' fault. But like, there's a lot of stuff going on with kind of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust right now, and how it's priced, and the management fees and stuff like that. You're essentially yeah. getting. I mean, it is not a good way to get exposure to Bitcoin. I'm sorry, no, no matter what you think about it. Um, Why wouldn't they partner with like Coinbase? Or I I don't know. That's expensive too. Like it just. Well, seems there were rumors like that they were going to try to acquire Coinbase. Yeah. And then FTX is like, I'm going to buy all you guys in three years anyway. So, <laughs> SBF, SBF. Yeah. Um, but so there's that. So there's the, the product structure, which is basically you're taking unseen levels of, of risk, right? There are just new premiums in those products uh, that might not be super visible. But two of these five products, one is a Bitcoin Cash trust, and the other, other is an Ethereum Classic trust. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a great. Are read. you kidding me? <laughs> Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, most yeah. people are, they're not going to know. They don't know this stuff. Like, no, it, it so, just shows how far behind they are. Right. Like, and not to knock any of that stuff, but like, come on. Like, if you spend any time in this ecosystem, like you just give them Ethereum and Bitcoin. That's it. You know? Yeah, and then you want to throw some cool altcoins in there. Like, Uniswap, go, f but like what? Yeah, Throw basic I'm... attention token. Grayscale has a, a basic attention to token. I mean, Brave, Bra the Brave browser, like these are like secular trends. And I'm not sure Bitcoin Cash is. Maybe I'm an idiot, but no, no, you're not. Um, I trust that read. So yeah. it's it's bullish. I mean, this is really good news, but it's also like guys, come on. And even like Morgan Stanley, I remember they rolled out access to. Uh, it was like an actively traded Bitcoin fund. And maybe there are some people in this market that can trade Bitcoin correctly. In my experience, the best traders are like these random kids on Twitter. Honestly, those are the right people to actively trade <laughs> like crypto. It is not, I'm sorry, it's not the Bitcoin guy at Morgan Stanley. That is not the guy that you want actively trading this stuff. Yeah, I'm starting to disagree with that because you have this you have futures and options now it's really like it's getting to be institutional where like you know when you see guys have no retail trader has visibility into hey some guy just bought 50 million dollars in, in a put spread and here's what the deltas it creates and um here's the pin risk at this certain you know you don't get that type of color you, you might you can do technicals and psychological levels but like it's getting as the products get more advanced, there's way more Fair. that goes to it. Yeah. Fair. Um, all right. Let's move on to our next bit of uh, next story here. Two Chinese stories, um, both of which are pretty interesting. So uh, China is considering asking education companies to go nonprofit. Uh, so China is considering asking companies that offer tutoring on the school curriculum to go nonprofit. 
um, as part of a sweeping set of constraints that could decimate the country's $100 billion education tech industry. In rules currently being mulled, the platforms will likely no longer be able to raise capital or go public. Listed firms will also probably no longer be allowed to invest in or acquire education firms teaching school subjects, while foreign capital will also be barred from the sector. Um, local regulators will stop approving new school education firms seeking to offer tutoring on China's compulsory syllabus and require extra scrutiny of existing online platforms. Uh, Chinese education stocks uh, in the U.S. Pre- uh, are tanking. Uh, EDU is down 44%, um, TAL is down 47%, and GOTU is down 50%. Um, lot of is this, this is an interesting move. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you go with this. Tyler, tell me what your read is because I think we have got different reads here. Yeah. Okay, this is mainstream media will not touch this story because they don't get it, right? And they're starting, I think they're starting to, but China is centralizing power. Like they're closing their capital account. They first did cryptocurrency, then they they stopped US listings. Then, you know, the DD thing happened. DD is down 21% today. This is, a, I mean, it's increasingly becoming a cold war to me where it's like all these Chinese listed companies are toast. Like they're not even real entities where you get like cash flows. They're based in the Caymans, the VIE entity, and, and they're all down huge, right? Bill Huang was a big investor in in. GSX, which is one of those online tech companies, right? We've talked about this in the past. I'm I'm good buddies with Carson Block, who's been all over the story. And essentially, them shutting this down, it's like it's really fishy because it was already kind of this fraudulent industry. Like every short seller on the street was like, these online tech names are just like manufactured fake companies. And, and like it's now they're all they're all zeros like GSX G, now the ticker is they changed the ticker to GOTU is down 60% today Tal Education is down 66% 100 billion dollar industry wiped out in a day tell me that those weren't like weird kind of slush funds i don't know it, it just does not make any sense but the point is they shut down cryptocurrency they sh- they're shutting down this. They're deleveraging the economy and taking out like the real crap, the misallocation of capital. And I think it's, I think it's their way of kind of like making their capital markets more reliable. Maybe that's their plan in the in the future. And this isn't to like, yeah. you know, I think they they realize how much misallocation has happened. I mean, GSX was a thirty billion dollar company at one point, and now it's going to be zero within like six months. Like that's insane. Right, so there is something happening here, and not only that, I think we're going to bring up that the next story, which is China ever even bigger. Yeah, and you, I'll let you get into that, but this, all this stuff is happening all at the same time, right? And my experience from like 2008 when I was trading there is like you'd hear these stories, and you wouldn't know exactly how they connected. And it was like, I call it smoke because you're like, okay, first shut down cryptocurrency, then DD, and then and it's this trail of breadcrumbs where you're like, okay, what are they exactly trying to do here, right? Like, mm-hmm. They're trying to like calm the inflation, take the misallocation of capital and put it in the right direction and, and make sure that there's no credit crisis. And I think knowing them, they'll probably be able to manage it better than like the U.S. did. Um, But there's a really fascinating dichotomies. They're actually deleveraging, allowing defaults, allowing the market to be a little bit freer, if you will. Yeah, that was my read too, actually. And like for a centralized economy to do that, it's really ironic because us in the U.S., there's no defaults. Household, there's zero defaults anywhere. They're, they're lending money hand over fist to everybody so that they can – and it's like not a free market. So I don't know what the hell to believe anymore. Okay. Wait. Let me – so I agree with you on a lot. And I actually want to yeah. – there's an interesting parallel to that interview you did with Russell Clark here to bring mm-hmm. up. So there's like – first of all, I just want to say I don't have any special knowledge on this and I want to not overextend my skis and talk about stuff I don't understand. My understanding of China is a very much authoritarian command and control 
type economy, right? So when I actually see cracking down on the education sector, one one thing there is it's it's hard not to think that is it a powerful locus of control, right? Almost if it, even if it's just symbolic, like cracking down on an education part of the sector. But over like the last couple of months, we've really seen China centralize power, right? That whether that's what happened with Didi or more importantly like Ant Financial and Jack Ma, what that kind of reeks of to me is that is the government showing people who the fuck is in charge, no matter mm-hmm. what. Um, so I think yeah. there's, that's a big part of it. I also think that there are clearly, there's an element of this that they're a very levered economy in general. And if you look at what's happening over here, potentially inflation and asset bubbles, that is much more scary to an economy that's much more levered. So they're literally just saying, we're clamping down on this. They're clamping down on cryptocurrency. There was a... a release of crude uh, from Chinese inventories, like an unprecedented amount, a couple million barrels. They're really trying to clamp down on commodity inflation over there. And part of that is that how levered they are. What's kind of interesting is that we we have made a decision in the US because we've punished savers for so long to make the stock market the de facto savings account of US citizens. Mm -hmm. So China hasn't really made that, that hasn't really made that decision yet. Um, So I guess from Xi's perspective, like, so what, what you and Russell said as well is that the decision to not devalue might have been actually a policy decision to promote the middle class, right? So mm-hmm. from Xi's perspective, it's like, hey, I'm going to show these speculators and these other wealthy people, they're not in charge. I'm in charge here, right? Yeah. I can slap down the stock market and my middle and lower class don't actually get punished that badly. Um, it's kind of a win-win. You can... I'm obviously speculating yeah. here, but the story makes more sense to me. I don't, I don't know what's better either. It's, it's really a fascinating point in history, but I agree. I think if, if what he's really trying to do is incentivize the middle class and really grow that, that bread and butter, um, then you, what he's doing makes a lot of sense, right? It's, yeah. it's, and, and so that's what. I'm trying to read more Chinese stuff from the Chinese perspective and I'm trying to less be less like American about it. And if that's what's happening, the growth is more even, it's more socially just. And right now America's got the opposite problem. I mean, but at the same time, we are still the innovative, uh, we need in America, we don't want to be the giant refinancing mechanism. We want to incentivize innovation and growth in the next technology, the future of technology, right? And I think that's why the U.S. policymakers are really letting this run hot because they're like, we need to really incentivize future growth, right? Instead of just create this giant like debt bubble, really. Like borrowing money and then creating equity out of thin air because rates go lower. So I I don't know how to square those two things, but man, we're at an interesting time. Howdy guys. Excited to talk to you a little bit about this week's sponsor, Matrix Support. If you're like me, you're trying to figure out how can I make my crypto go as far as it possibly can. Well, Matrix Support makes it really easy to do the simple stuff like just buying and trading and you're holding your crypto on a secure platform that you don't have to worry about. But they also help you take that next step to doing things like getting loans against your crypto or earning yield on it. Let's talk about the yield part because for me, that earn feature is the most interesting thing that they do. Number one, first step, you can start earning up to 30% APY on your USDC deposits. That's about 29.99% more than if you just kept those funds in a bank account. Talk about a no brainer. Number two, their team walked me through this. They have made accessing DeFi easy. And guys, I am telling you, I am the biggest Luddite on the face of the earth. If I can understand this stuff, then I promise, so can you. So don't wait. At least go check them out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. All right, guys. Last story here that I want to cover before we get into kind of the tweets and takes uh, portion of this episode is... Uh, Evergrande. So Chinese developer Evergrande share price has sunk to four years lows as worries about its debt mounts. Now, I just want to help set the scene for you a little bit here. So three days ago, this article comes out in the Wall Street Journal. Here's the title. Has Evergrande's long delayed debt reckoning finally arrived? Talk about a title, man. Well done, whoever at the Wall Street Journal came up with that title. 
boom, really sits with you. Now, a little bit of background on Evergrande Group in general. Um, so they are China's second largest property developer by sales, um, making it the 152nd largest group in the entire world by revenue. Uh, they're based out of China's Guangdong province, and they sell apartments mostly to upper and middle income dwellers, although they have branched out into some other sort of more questionable business lines. There's like an EV thing they're doing right now. A lot of question marks uh, kind of about their focus in general. Um, in 2018, it became the world's most valuable real estate company. And kind of around the time that Evergrande is building, there's this there's this debt bubble uh, and kind of China property bubble that's kind of inflating as well. Tell you want to talk just a little bit about like broad strokes, kind of what's the real estate situation looking like over in China? Yeah, I mean, this is no new story, but basically Ch the Chinese property bubble has been speculated for, for years and years and years. And it's like waiting for Godot to, to call it on it collapsing and they've built these giant ghost cities and they're expecting to move people from, you know, rural China into the cities, which is happening. And, uh, but they did it in such, you know, crazy mass that with lots and lots of debt, people have been calling for like the debt collapse. And now, you know, we've seen the bonds fall off twice and it's kind of been like a restructuring. And I think, and then now it's really like, the stock is really falling. The bonds are falling, and I I think it's probably goes along the lines of what the the administration wants to take a lot of the leverage out of the system and misallocation of capital. So, but there's knock on effects. I mean, this thing is you know there's speculation three hundred fifty six billion dollars of exposure. It's a, it's big and. You know, that's they are the largest issuer of dollar denominated Chinese junk bonds. Like that's a fact. So if they're borrowing money from like the commercial paper market and doing all these funky things, this is subprime on steroids. I think if they're only one, you know, one company and then there's probably a lot of other exposure there. You know, you could be looking upwards of, you know, a trillion or a couple trillion dollars. Um, so this is something we should probably be watching for global markets to see if it spins out of control. You know, like I said, there's no real credit stress in the U S but they're starting to be a little bit in, in China, especially with Evergrande. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the point of going to that too, is just like to give you guys some sense of how systemically important this company really is. Right. And there's this other great, uh, I mean, I think the, the founder now is like the fourth, richest guy in China, something like that. So we're talking about real wealth. I think he's worth something like $30 billion. Um, and a huge systemically important company has been built here. Um, I this, this Wall Street Journal article refers to Evergrande as a gray rhino, which uh, I'm not sure that's common. I'd never heard it before. But basically, it's an obviously well understood threat or danger uh, that people are looks like it might now just become um, an imminent problem, which is pretty mm -hmm. interesting. So um, like our friend um, Greg Foss likes to talk about, there's uh, there were problems in the debt market, which have kind of rebounded or uh, trickled up to what's going on in equity. So this all started with a court order freezing about $20 million uh, worth of assets. And that kind of triggered the, like all these knock-on effects that we're looking at, which led to a 25% dip in the price uh, and yields are spiking. So the yield to maturity for uh, bonds that are maturing in 2023 are now 35%. So that's a really high yield, signaling that investors think that there's a lot of danger there, basically. Um, and like, like the, I think just the way the finances of this company are laid out is kind of fishy. Um, there, like you mentioned, like it looks like there's a lot of off balance sheet debt uh, essentially for them, which is a little bit spooky. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about like if there were problems here? Speculate. Put your speculator hat on here, Tyler. What would yeah. some of these knockout effects be if this debt were to go bad? So this is where it, I'm going to put my conspiracy theory hat on, and you know, a lot of the there's this guy on Twitter last the last bear standing, and he's had a couple interesting threads on it. But in giant giant debt bubbles, you always see people, you know go over their skis. And, you know, like Warren Buffett says, you only find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. If this is the tide going out, things could be way more interconnected in a globalized marketplace than you think. And so 
you know, like I mentioned before, Xi cracked down on, on cryptocurrencies. He's closing off the capital account. He's trying to take out the commodity inflation. And maybe this is the real reason behind it is it is they're really taking out the leverage of the property sector and kind of like f taking the misallocation of capital away and finally dealing with it. But you have to do that. And who, I mean, their speculation, the last bear standing is essentially is saying that since they issue so much of these like dollar denominated bonds, there's a company that's been buying it, providing financing for them on a short term basis so they can go out and, and build these these properties, right? So there's speculation that Tether has been, you know, there's no real clarity on what Tether buys. Are they buying Evergrande's um, commercial paper, right? And then you get into the scenario, which is if you hearken back to the 2008 crisis, like, there was the breaking of the buck of the money markets when like, you know, that scared the crap out of Ben Bernanke and he guaranteed them because, you know, the money markets are the short term funding markets that kind of fund everything. So if Tether actually breaks the buck, what's the knock on effect? Because if it's backed by commercial paper that's trading at a 50 percent discount, 50 cents on the dollar, which is Evergrande, then maybe that, you know, stable coin is not money good. And that therein has like all repercussions for digital assets. And you kind of, I mean, like there's no real clarity in this stuff. Everyone's like shady. Like no one, I don't think anyone really gets it. And this is the stuff that like books are made of five years when they connect all the dots and like, ah, oh, yeah, that, that's how it worked. Now, I don't know if that's, this is just conspiracy theory mostly, but it, it all feels very like there's some smoke that they're all trying to like sweep under the rug real quick. And you know what? They very well, very may well be able to because we're living in a world where like balance sheets for governments are just exploding. You can paper over anything now. So, you know, what is fiat? Um, that's, that, that's the main question, but you still need to be aware of this stuff, I think, because there's knock on effects that are global in nature. Yeah. Well, you've kind of segued uh, into our next section here, which is the tweets and takes section. And I actually just want to lay all this out, uh, right? Because there was a pretty interesting connection made in between what's going on with Evergrande and Tether. And I'm not 100% sold on it yet, but I do want to just lay out the argument. So in case you've been living under a rock uh, for the last couple months, actually even before that, like years, to be honest, there's been speculation around Tether. It's kind of a lightning rod actually, uh, for folks that are outside the crypto community, I would say more so than in. But if you go back to 2017, 2018, people were divided. There were like people who liked Tether, and there were people who didn't really like Tether all that much. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever you want to say about it, it's a very influential instrument in crypto, and not very much is known about it, okay? I will, I will come out and personally say my bias. I, I don't necessarily think anything wrong, but I don't know. Let's, so, so now... This, uh, as you were saying, Tyler, there's a great thread, this guy, The Last Bear Standing, um, put together this really interesting thread kind of connecting what's going on in with Evergrande with Tether. So you kind of referred to some of this stuff, but just to lay it out very clearly, for the first time, basically, Tether released their information to the New York AG, basically stating what the status of their reserves are. And now they're, quote unquote, fully backed. 50% of their reserves are made up of commercial paper, which is double A rated debt, short term maturity, right? It should be pretty like solid stuff. That's why they're allowed to that's why they're allowed to do that. Um, one of the and, and basically um, this guy makes the connection uh, between um, issuance of uh, commercial paper from Evergrande and kind of this unknown commercial paper that um, that uh, Tether has, because one of the other things about Tether that I've actually heard anecdotally is true as well, is that nobody who trades commercial paper has ever heard of Tether. So you're kind of like, well, how is that possible? How can people who aren't trading uh, or, or trading uh, commercial paper never have heard of Tether? And one explanation for that is if they're, <laughs> if they're buying it directly from, uh, you know, Evergrande. Um, so like you said, the implications of this are if... Right now, the 
the value of that debt is in question, then it could have this big knock-on effect in crypto. That's not particularly well understood because then essentially crypto isn't – or Tether isn't reserved. There could be a crisis of confidence in Tether. And mm. to your point, that could be the crypto equivalent of breaking the buck because kind of Tether focus functions as this weird like money market slash euro dollar system thing. Uh, but it's systemically important for crypto. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And to piggyback on that, to play the, the Contra – Grant Williams had a, a podcast on Tether specifically, and he runs through all the kind of like sh somewhat shady things and the characters behind it. And it, it doesn't it doesn't pass the sniff test, really, in in his defense and in, in the legacy financial world's defense. It's like I don't there's not much clarity there and you don't get like this rosy feeling about it by any means. But like, you're also looking at a nascent technology and you got to give it some like, you know, people are in, in venture capital, they're so full of shit too. You know, they're all like telling you, they'll never tell you a bad thing because like, oh man, my, 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 my company's going great. You know, we're hitting all these growth metrics. Like you guys are the only company that says, hey, we're profitable. And like, you know, that's why I came here. But like it. It's it's funny how when you're at an early stage of growth, you you can't really be as clear. So that's kind of how I'm taking it as like there's risk, there's reward. I'm thinking there's more reward to the growth of crypto than the risk in Tether right now. But there's some concerning things here. I I would agree with you. I would agree. I think um... – I, I'm of a couple of different minds about it, so I'm just going to think out loud, and you're going to have to dissect what you can from my babbling. Uh, yeah. But basically, I I agree. I When I hear people talk about Tether, I have an immediate emotional reaction, and it's a negative emotional reaction. And I tried to be introspective, like, why do I have this emotional reaction? And I think it kind of feels a little bit like punching down a bit because it's so new, and if you're going to sit there and point like, this is a risk, that's a risk. And generally, the people who do this are people who are trying to justify why it's all a Ponzi and a fraud. And it does. I think that's my biggest problem. Usually, yeah. these arguments come from people that are looking for it. And I'm kind of like, look, if you want to look for that stuff, you can find it. I mm. have just kind of said, I believe in this space. That's not to say it's all sunshine and roses and whatever. There are probably going to be huge problems. There's a great podcast with this guy, Taron Chitra, who kind of lays out the evolution of electronic markets and he lays out a very compelling case for why there's a lot of hidden danger in DeFi. In a, not necessarily, but like, there are going to be market crashes. There are going to be things that are wrong. If you're looking for that, congratulations. You will be proven right. I've just yeah. decided, for me, is not particularly useful to dwell on this stuff. And the last thing I'll say, too, is like, there's this, you know, people from finance rightly point out that when people in crypto try to talk about traditional finance, they sound like idiots. Well, it goes the other way too. When people in traditional finance try to talk about market structure stuff in crypto, they sound like idiots and they yeah. do not get it right. They like focus on all the wrong things. They interpret things wrong. So it's like speaking, you know, two, two different languages. But I will, languages. I will say this. The crypto people cannot simply explain shit. They are, it's the most frustrating thing ever. It's like, if you know something really well, the really good crypto people, they can break it down and say, this is what this means. You can relate it to other stuff. But like, you get in, some of these PR people, oh my God. It's like, this is a decentralizing the... What? What? So, the crypto universe is, is mostly full of shit. If you... There's really smart people that are like – it's like that 10% that understand it, understand the evolution, can simplify it for, for dumb people like me. But like on the whole, you ask a normal person in, in crypto, I don't think they understand any of this stuff. There's people that spent their whole careers in traditional finance before the 2008 crisis that had no clue what was going on when the credit crisis hit. And then they needed simplified books like Michael Lewis write about it and it's, et cetera. So this is sort of the same thing to me where it's like there's people that get it. They're like 5% probably. 
then there's people that 95 percent don't and they can't translate anything i'm i'm with you man i like i if you're hiding behind jargon it's probably a good indicator that you don't understand what you're really talking about because if yeah. you have mastery over a topic then you put it in simple language that anyone can understand if you don't mm-hmm. really get it people tend to rely on these like borrowed phrases that they could be like but like this person said it you know yeah. it's because like not your words you don't have to go out on a limb and deconstruct what it it's, actually is so it's the whole peter Thiel thing is when you get like a bunch of like jargon words we are you know solving you know soft or SaaS based platform that puts things into the cloud and like, you know, you get these like little snippets of shit that like people say to like raise capital and it, and like, it just like cycles into the ethos of that's what sort of what crypto is. Like yeah. no one really knows what tether is besides like a few, a few people do, but I will say the analogy there to finance is perfect because it's the same deal over there too. Yeah. 100%. It, you know, there actually is like, because I, I'm open about the fact, I, I was a classics psych major in school. I had no background in this. And at one point in my life, about two years ago, I decided I really, really wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about finance in general. It is so ungodly hard to actually just find information. And if you want to learn today about like what market makers do, good luck. It doesn't exist. The information isn't out there. I've decided it's not even out there. I'm actually consistently, my mind is blown by how basic the stuff people debate about in finance is. It's like, is QE liquidity positive or negative? It's like wars, you know, on both sides. Like, guys, this is a policy. How is this not known? Why are we debating this? It's nuts. And, you know, I've listened to these podcasts. I've, like, taken notes. I've compared the notes. People say different things. I asked this person what this person yeah. said. I'm convinced nobody knows. <laughs> I, I, it's – but it, it happens. You can see how it happens. Do you know the stupid Einstein thing, the five stages of genius? It's, like, smart, yeah. intelligent, brilliant, um, you know, genius. And then the fifth stage is simple. And we've gotten to, like – the genius stage of complexity where it's like, it's so complex that like nobody understands it. Like the Euro dollar system, no one really gets what's going on. What really happened is just like, they got off the gold standard, right? We got currencies where be able to print and they could steal debt from the future. That's really, they stole money from their children's growth. Like that's what happened. Noel, what's the guy that wrote that book? Um, about mankind. He's like a socio uh, anthropologist. Um, Yuval. Yuval Ferrari. Sorry. Um, humans. He wrote humans, right? It's called. Humans. Yeah. 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 And he talks about how like debt, it's like this weird thing where you're really just like pulling forward from the future and like stealing from different pockets of other humans. Like that's really what debt is. When debt you think. is. And it is. When you think about it from that perspective, like a real, like humans figured out this concept of stealing from the future. That's amazing, right? It's amazing. It, it really is amazing. Is. And like, yeah. and then you wrap all these narratives around it. But that at the bottom, you're stealing growth from the future and hoping that your idea actually comes to fruition, which most don't. I know. It's pretty amazing. Pretty yeah. amazing. All right, let's make, move through some of these other things as well. I want to talk a little bit about this uh, paper that, or that is a transcript of an interview that Russell Napier did uh, that was kind of making the rounds earlier this week. Um, really interesting. And I think you and I talked about this a little bit. Um, I tend to fall into the camp probably that we're still in a deflationary environment. Um, I know you are probably lean a little bit more towards the inflationary um environment or moving towards secular inflation Mm -hmm. i will say this is about the most compelling thing that i have read um really succinct really good arguments from this guy um and i'll summarize the two that like really stood out to me um and then you can chime in on what you liked about this particular piece but two of the things that he said that really stuck with me was one he was talking about the labor pool in china 
basically. And that's something that you and I have talked about, too. You talked about it in your Russell Clark interview. But basically, if it's political tensions that break down, whatever it is, all of that offshoring that we've been doing of wages and labor to China, that is either either wages are going to go up in China or we're not going to be allowed to outsource there anymore. And there's political effort to bring them back here. That should be very inflationary. So mm-hmm. that like really stuck with me. Um, and then the other thing is he actually <laughs> made this connection. You don't hear that from like Lacey Hunt or Jeff Snyder or any of the deflationists, which is they don't pay attention to China. I actually brought this up to Jeff on the interview this week, and he actually said that this – I brought both of these things up to him actually on this interview. Shame on you for not watching. Uh, And he (laughs) – and he – and he – and he he said that it's actually deflationary. And for the life of me, I can't remember what his argument was, but I'll go back and – Listen, but um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just it's just really interesting stuff. The other thing that he talked about is when the Fed stepped in and essentially uh, protected or put a floor in on the um, corporate debt market, um, and mm-hmm. that being is like if you are if if you are guaranteeing commercial bank lending even to like the lowest of the low shitty junk bonds, then that should have a mat. I mean, it should theoretically increase bank lending, and that's real M two money growth. Mm-hmm. That hasn't really played out yet, but I like, I see where he's coming from there. So I don't know if you had any other takes on this paper, but I just thought it was really fascinating. I, I mean, I'm just in the camp that at every little hiccup of disinflation or deflationary environment, the policymakers now know that like the problems are so big, the debt problems are so big, they they need to print, and not only that, but People now understand, the labor pool now understands what QE is because during the pandemic, it realized that QE raises financial asset prices. And it's a direct, it, there's no, it, before you could kind of like spin it that the economy was doing well, blah, blah, blah. There's a direct correlation between like QE and asset prices now. And if now it's political, it's you're bailing out the people, the asset owners now, instead of now the labor class is like, we want some of that. Give us the fiscal. Our wages are going up now. And like Russell Clark said, from 1940 to like 1980, wages went up by 13x. 13x. From 1980 to 2020, they went up 2x. Meanwhile, financial assets went up like God knows how much. So labor's been getting punished, right? I think they're they're unionizing. People have it out for Jeff Bezos. Like you should you can feel it. And that's where I stand with like Russell Napier and, and, and the, the inflationary guys. Where it's like, yeah, fundamentally I guess the the Snyder slash Lacey Hunt things make a lot of sense, but like the politics, man, you can't get around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. I mean, at a, at a certain point, again, it depends on whether or not how powerful you think central banks really are and how much you think they're an extension of the state and therefore the will of the people. And what mm-hmm. I will say is for the last, like you've been banging on this drum, we've favored capital over labor. Basically, there were policy decisions that got made in the Reagan era and capital has been favored over labor. And you can see this in the way that central banks will basically jump to protect asset prices but when's the last time? When's the last time you've even seen a politician running on a campaign of wage growth? N- not in my entire lifetime. AOC, I mean, like she's really, and and from the historical perspective, I get she's the reaction to all this, and like people call mm-hmm. her socialist and everything. I, I'm, I actually find what she says pretty compelling, and I think it's compared to a lot of other uh, politicians. You know, it makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not like, uh, and this is me being like politically neutral. I think just like if you objectively step back, everyone's like, oh, she's so stupid. That's so stupid. And it's like, mm-hmm. is it? Or like, has, from a historical perspective, it's actually like makes more sense. Like, what do you, do you think this is going to go on? If, if this goes on indefinitely, you're going to have like World War Three. Yeah. You need to like have a, a strong middle class. I agree. I agree. I, I'm also 
caught here with my own history cap on and just like I'm what I see Trump and Bernie Sanders and AOC as all part of the same populist bandwagon. Yeah. Um, and like my history hat tells me when populists tend to get elected at times of great income inequality and during periods of social strife and mm-hmm. rarely does that work out super well. Um, now it's funny being in that situation because a lot of the stuff AOC is saying is kind of like what we talk about, like favoring labor again, right? And actually trying to like improve people's lives and stuff like that. Um, or like the qual- the average quality of life for the average person in the U.S. Um, but I know it doesn't really historically tend to work out that well. So I, it's hard in in the moment. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. But it obviously like made sense to everyone then too when they all got elected back then. Well, and it never tends to work out that well. Well, you need new institutions. Like I think that's you, like, you do when, when FTR new institutions did it. The New Deal. It was like a building of new institutions. It was the first turning of like you. You gotta start from scratch again and not just have the same political nonsense. And I think we're probably moving towards that once. Okay. Yeah. What do you need before new institutions? I think like a complete crash. You need a catalyst, baby. Yeah, yeah. you need political will. You I need don't know. To su- you need you need something to summon the political will to do the thing because you can't just t- you couldn't no politician would be successful tomorrow if they were like, guys, scrap the, the institution. We're doing away with the IMF and the World Bank and the CDC is going to get a deep look at. Like, no, that's not – that wouldn't work. What if the but pandemic was the catalyst? We whiffed on the – we boffed the pandemic. We boffed it. We didn't even do the debt reset thing. We didn't even do the debt reset. Honestly, so I literally – it's funny. I recorded with Pippa Malman yeah. earlier today. I literally asked this question, like, you, a crisis is a terrible thing to, like, go to waste. What are the polit- political ramifications? Like, political things get passed through during crises, and in finance, you're supposed to, like, after there's a crisis of confidence, you're supposed to write off a lot of the bad debt and be like, hey, that sucked, but at least we're through the, the thick of it, and then you can go on to building. And mm-hmm. we didn't do either one of those things. The political ramifications of COVID was we have more of a surveillance state than ever, and we didn't write off any of the debt. We boffed it. I mean, we kind of did. We printed $12 trillion between you know fiscal and monetary. I think they, they – and they set in motion this MMT thing that's like I think now bipartisan, honestly. I know. Is that good? Is that good? Do we want that? Maybe. I don't know. We'll find out in hindsight. But I think like what else are you going to do? Are you going to let everything just implode? I've kind of come around to this where I'm like, maybe this is the passing of the torch and we're just going to run over. You know how we're like complaining about like, oh, I can't own a house or whatever. What if, what if these negative real rates are here and millennials can borrow at, at advantageous rates and then the boomers who have no earnings power, they can't work anymore. They get eaten up by inflation, right? Like that's. That's a, the mindset that we might, I think we might be moving into where like boomers are like, well, I'm only getting like a 3% cost of living adjustment on my pension, but every, all the prices are going up 10% a year. And I'm, and I'm sitting here like, well, my wages are going up like 15 and my house is going up too. And that, that could be what's changing that millennials and Gen Zers haven't had. Mm. Is that fair? Could be. Yeah, I think that's actually a fair take. I don't know. I guess I don't really know how this shakes out. It does kind of feel like we're heading towards some kind of transition in general. Um, I, I, want, I want to end it on this because I would love to get your opinion here. Um, talked a little bit recently about just kind of the difference in community that at least I'm sort of seeing in between what I would classify as hardcore Bitcoiners and more of like kind of ETH and DeFi. And I've seen I've seen tweets like this before. So this is a tweet from uh, Dan Held uh, yesterday, which is Bank Fine since 2000, Bank of America 82 billion, J.P. Morgan 35 billion, Citigroup 25 billion, yada yada yada. Uh, it all adds up between these big bulge brackets, like 100 billion dollars. It's time for Plan B. Okay, 
Um, now there's this tweet from Ryan Sean Adams, um, partner of Permissionless. Uh, a self-sovereign digital currency without a self-sovereign digital banking system is kind of useless. That's why we need DeFi. And the reason I'm highlighting these two tweets together is because I've never understood, like, I get the concept of being your own bank, but Bitcoin doesn't, Bitcoin's not going to, like, replace banks. They're not trying to be the same thing, in my opinion. Bitcoin is, I'm taking Bitcoin at its word, and I think it's the absolute best at what it does. I own a lot of Bitcoin, just as a disclaimer. My, it is a, it is a store of value asset. It is, in my opinion, gold 2.0 plus a little bit of extra. It is pristine collateral. It is what you want when governments are in trouble. I buy that narrative. I'm listening to people. That's why I own a lot of it. I'm with you. But that's not banking. What DeFi is trying to replace, in my opinion, is banking. That is building a bottoms-up re-architecturing of the financial system where ownership is the base of it, basically. So you are plugging into these open source softwares, they do the things, but you maintain control of your assets. So like when I see these tweets about these bankers and their fees and that gets connected to Bitcoin, I'm like, you guys are connecting it to the wrong thing. If you want to yell at these untransparent, you know, criminal activity, the bankers are, that should be an, that should be an advertisement for DeFi, at least in my opinion. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? I, I think you nailed that one. I think it's so spot on. This goes to that that Mark Hart interview he did like three years ago. He goes, mm -hmm. you don't understand. Bitcoin is, there's 200 trillion of reserve assets in the world. And it's probably like 300 trillion now, right? Yeah. It's that time. That's crazy. But yeah. Nah, maybe it's like 250. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin is a reserve asset. It is not meant to be a transactional currency. There, there's so many assets in the world that he says they devalue slowly. And there's no asset that actually doesn't dilute itself over time. Bitcoin's the first one of those, right? So it's, it really is a reserve asset and it will never be really a transactional thing. Yeah. Whereas, I think you're onto something where it's like DeFi might be the transactional currency. And it's like US Treasuries. You don't transact with US Treasuries. US Treasuries are collateral when you want giant loans. Like when you want, uh, I'm going to pledge this treasury and I'm going to get, you know, something back, right? Mm -hmm. And Or I can pledge my stock and margin, margin the stock I own. Like that is a reserve asset. But like, I don't think... That I think that like DeFi actually has more of a chance to be the transactional thing, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it's such again, it's just such a misnomer to call these things currencies. Bitcoin is one of the only networks, like, let's just start calling them for what they are they're networks. All of mm -hmm. these things, these protocols, they're networks. And there's a new way of monetizing and owning those networks. Bitcoin is trying to be the store of value reserve currency network. I don't think. And then DeFi, the way that I conceptualize it, is that's the sandbox or the rails of moving different types of assets around. It's like if you want to go back to the bizarre example, right? Bitcoin is the thing people want to own and trade at the marketplace, and the marketplace itself is DeFi. I they're not competitive in my in my um, in my thinking, uh, but they're just totally totally and completely different but complementary things um, yeah they can be that's yeah. the funniest thing and there's like this antagonistic but you got to remind yourself that there's only it's one percent of the world really owns cryptocurrency as it is right so i know you have these warring parties that's just who it's how humans create identity and like it, they look at someone else in the mirror and they want to like fight them right this has been, just for me personally, um, and I'm still learning as I'm going through, just a fantastic education in bias and how bias occurs and builds. And on the one hand, you know, you could – I actually just don't think it's ever possible to escape bias at all. And because, like, let's take the example of Bitcoin, right? <laughs> if you buy it, you're biased. 
<laughs> you're biased about it. But if you don't own it and it's going up, then you are also biased. You have the natural human emotion of wanting to see someone who's doing well crash and burn. <laughs> and everyone has it. And yeah. I just, it's like, and then, okay, okay let's take that. Let's go to something way bigger and social, which is like people are trying to like institutionalize, like eliminating bias. And you have to take all these tests so that you're not biased. And it's like, dude, you can't do that. It, it, it's like brainwashing. I, That's brainwashing. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And it, to me, it's just like, it's where the political correct train went like the, the woke train went just like off the rails where you're like, you can't, it's someone's perception of the world through their own lens. It's like tolerance. You have to preach tolerance and like understanding like you, each other's perceptions. Cause like you can't just force someone to not have bias. Like it's impossible. I'm, I'm with you. I'm yeah. so with you. Like I, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm with you. I, you know, I feel bad. There are a couple other things I wanted to get to, but we've are, we've gone on long enough, man. Yeah. We, we like the sound of our own voices. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. This was great. Uh, guys, uh, for those of you listening, give Tyler and me feedback. Did you like the new format? Did you like how it was before? Are there parts of the new format that you liked? Are, you, are there parts that you didn't like? Tell us what you thought, because again, you know, we do the show for you, so we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, Mike, all right. Pleasure. That's it. That's it, my man. Okay. Enjoy the weekend. Keep those waitresses laughing. Oh, God. Dude, you're the one who dropped the Twitter bomb. It was like, hey, grills are going off the charts. Like, you know, sales and grills are great. Get your dad, you know, uniform ready. What I actually <laughs> said, Tyler, this was my tweet. I said, dads, this is your moment. And it was like a Wall Street Journal article about how grill IPOs by the way, in case anyone thinks meme stocks are dead, grill IPOs are the hot thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wasn't that a famous that. thing? Chainsaw, Al Dunlap. What? Am I making this up? Wasn't there a grill company or something? Oh, you mean Hacksaw Jim Duggan? No, no, no. Chainsaw, Al Dunlap. And this guy, he was like one of those like 80s, uh, you know, slash and burn um, kind of turnaround management types. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And now he famously is like, uh, he's kind of, people view him as having many of the traits of a psychopath. Uh, sunbeam. Sunbeam. That's usually how it goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah. He's doing some accounting chicanery. But yeah, it's it's just grill stocks. Those are the new, uh, new hot thing. So go buy them, <laughs> I guess. Dad economy. <laughs> Not financial advice. Okay, yeah. buddy. All Same right. time next week. Catch up.